It is 530 and time for our two on your side town hall on this Wednesday. Thanks for being here with us, everybody. I'm Michael Wooten and I'm Kate Welsh. Chauffeur, you have questions. We're always working to get you answers. 849-2200 is the number to text us ahead this half hour. So many shortages. Supply and demand is all out of whack due to COVID-19. An expert guides us through what is happening six months now into the pandemic. Yeah, plus there's an app for that. Cell phones helping with contact tracing to stop the spread of COVID-19. Many privacy concerns with this, though. We're going to have a special report on that. And we're going to talk to Dr. John Torres to get the latest on vaccine development as the top health officials in the country went before Congress today. We do want to start here at 530 today with something almost all of us have faced at some point or another since this pandemic began, and that is a shortage. We have seen supply and demand problems hit so many different industries. The shortage is also affecting antibiotics and prescription drugs. Gun retailers are having trouble keeping ammo on the shelves. There's actually a nationwide shortage of bicycles. The home canning community is now in a conundrum. <laughs> Supply of coins apparently drying up. That makes even common coins sometimes hard to find. Apple is warning of a possible smartphone shortage. You may not be able to find your favorite beer the next time you shop because the pandemic has led to a nationwide shortage of aluminum cans. There are worries. Some may start panic buying, leading to even less supplies on shelves across the country. So why are these shortage happening? shortages happening and when may things get back to normal? Yeah, lots to discuss and we have just the person to help get us some answers. Joining us live is Jack Ampuja, president and CEO of Supply Chain Optimizers. He's also executive director of the Center for Supply Chain Excellency, Excellence rather, at Niagara University, a longtime professor and expert in this field. Jack, you are the perfect person to guide us through this. Thanks for coming on. Great to be with you. Thank you. So I think the thing that's most striking is that there are so many products that have at least intermittent shortages right now. As we just saw, it's all over the place. It's everything from ammunition to meat to bicycles. But which of these concern you the most? For me, it would be the food products just because they're such an integral part of everybody's life. Um, ammunition, yeah, people like to hunt, for example, but uh, we can probably get by without that. But when you start to have shortages in major food groups, that gets to be very concerning for people. Yeah, no doubt about that. And, and it's so wide ranging, Jack, when we talk about the food supply and so many different parts of it impacted. Um, let's talk about why this is happening. I know every shortage is different. And when you hear the reasons why, oftentimes it kind of makes sense. Um, but what are some of the big factors at play here into why we are seeing so many of these shortages now that we are more than six months into this? Well, at the top of the list would be concern about uh, rebound in COVID. So we've got a lot of people hoarding, almost the same thing that happened back in March, that people are looking for products. I don't know if there's going to be a problem, so I'm going to buy more than I need. The supply chain is pretty finely tuned, and when people start to hoard, that begins to upset things. Um, we talked a little bit about meats. Meats is its own little category, actually a very big category. And uh, one of the things that's happening there is that there are a very, very close work details within the factories that the workstations are side by side, a major opportunity for infection. Uh, the last I knew, Tyson Foods, the second largest processor of beef, chicken and pork, they've got over 10,000 employees who have tested positive for COVID. Mm. So those people are out of work at this point. Well, if they're not working, there's nobody processing, processing the carcasses. There are other reasons for other products that, um, for example, many of the big firms, and that would be companies like Nestle, Unilever, uh, General Mills, uh, they're cutting back on secondary and peripheral products, saying that we cannot supply everything. Uh, we're having some shortages, again, the hoarding. Uh, what I need to do is focus on a handful of products that I know I can make uh, would be satisfying most of the people. If you're using a secondary item, for example, it may not show up for months or ever, because once you lose your spot at the retail shelf, sometimes it's very, very difficult to get that back. And then we're also seeing an impact from import that the import volume coming into the United States is back to the levels it was at the summer of 2019, long before the COVID hit. But what's happening in conjunction with the high volume is that the ocean carriers, which have struggled for money for a number of years, they have cut back the supply that uh, they're doing code sharing on ships, for example, 
just like they do with airlines. Mm. And it used to be that the ships sailed always to meet the sailing schedule. If it had to leave Yokohama on the 15th, it left Yokohama. Today, if that ship isn't at a certain number of um, capacity, let's say 65, 70% of capacity loaded, that ship will not sail. Uh, they'll just call you and say, sorry, the ship didn't go. Uh, the next schedule is sailing two weeks. Expect your load to move in two weeks, Michael. So mm. we're getting a lot of things being pushed out. And just today, I, I had come across the fact that we were expecting things to start to loosen up with capacity uh, in November. Now the big carriers, ocean carriers, are telling us, uh, never mind November, it's going to go right into early 2021, that there's so much demand and loads that have been pushed back in favor of large companies like Walmart and Amazon. If I'm if I'm bringing tools in from uh, from Asia, if I'm bringing clothing, I still want that. It's just going to be many many weeks late. So we talk about that really slowing down, but overall, how much has the pandemic impacted imports? Uh, it's it's impacted imports a whole lot. That uh, because I this is one of the things I work on with customers almost every day. Um, I get calls from people saying, can you get me some space aboard a ship? And the answer is, no, I can't. That the carriers have come back to say we're supporting companies that have used our services all along. If you're a new customer, we just don't have capacity. Uh, call us uh, maybe at the end of November. So uh, regardless of what you're trying to move, it's extremely difficult to get space right now. And I know groups that uh, for, for years have never had to pay a premium to get space. Uh, during which is a busy time right now so oftentimes there's a premium a hundred dollars two hundred dollars i'm aware of premiums as much as a thousand dollars per ocean container to get space and you still can't get it and so it's that combination of very high demand and supply being constrained so it's pushing things uh further out into the future and right now the expectation is we will not see a return to normal standards until first quarter sometime all right, so that leads us um, into our final question here, Jack, and that, that kind of shows us how interconnected <laughs> everything is now. It's, it's a great big world out there, but looking forward, not just on, on the imports, which you just kind of touched on, but when we talk about store shelves and all these products that we try to buy, when do you expect that the entire supply chain system can get back to normal? And what would be your advice to people in the meantime? Uh, I'm expecting that if the carriers and the suppliers are saying first quarter, uh, I would push that out a little further that uh, probably into March before things start to get back to normal. And uh, the best advice I can offer is don't hoard that. I know it's a human tendency. I think we all want to do that when it's available. Let me grab it. But if you're hoarding, it's uh, it's making the uh, making the situation worse because you're pulling products that that aren't needed right now. If everybody bought only what they needed, things would be OK. And the other factor that that will fade away here is that we're in the fall season. This is picking season for a lot of things like um, pumpkins, for example, apples. So uh, we have a lot of trucks and warehouses being committed to that kind of produce. Well, that will all go away as the weather gets colder and we get into winter. So so there are a number of factors coming down the pipeline that will ease things uh, probably by uh, by the end of March. We really don't think much about how we get the things that we need. So we so appreciate your perspective. Jack, thanks for being with us. Uh, great to be with you. Thank you. Thanks. We want to quickly turn now to a big topic today, vaccine development, a major hearing on Capitol Hill. And let's bring in Dr. John Torres, senior medical correspondent for NBC News. It is always great to have you on the show. So you had this big hearing today, some of the top health officials in the federal government testifying, among them Dr. Fauci, the CDC director, the FDA commissioner. This went on for hours. Doctor, can you tell us what your biggest takeaway was? What was the headline here? And I think the headline here and the biggest takeaway is the fact that these four administrators are trying to get people confident in the vaccine itself. And that's probably the biggest thing they were trying to do today. On top of that, they're also saying, hey, I would take that vaccine myself. I would have my family take it once I know it's safe and effective. And by doing that, they're trying to say, hey, if I can take it, give it to my family, then hopefully you have confidence to take it too. I do think they need to go a step further, and that's making sure that transparency that they talked about is truly in place and that other groups, other researchers, other statisticians can look at this and say, yes, it's safe and effective. Dr. John Torres with NBC News. Thanks as always for coming on. We appreciate it. You bet. 
I think something else interesting today, Michael, was talking about the fact that they were saying, you know, science is going to guide decisions here and not politics, which is just such a huge part of this whole story altogether. Yeah, because at the end of the day, everybody has to have confidence that what is happening is on the up and up and that it's science based. And if people don't have that confidence and if we don't get enough people to take the vaccine, the whole system just doesn't work. Right. So and this whole idea that we're going to go back to normal after we get a vaccine, not if not enough people take it. Right. And it's tough because you're dealing with mixed messages as well. Yeah. All we'll right. Still, we'll stay on top of that. I know every day we get questions about the vaccine. Yeah.